company based on its sales, irrespective of whether it's making any money at all. Um, Senator Coates observes this is 2.3 percent tax on sales. Um, I just want to just touch on some of the real world consequences that are happening right now in Pennsylvania because this tax went into effect on January 1. Correct. And it's happening now. And here's, here's what's happening in Pennsylvania. Fuji Rebio Diagnostics in Malvern, a world leader in the production of diagnostics that detect cancer, they had to put on a hiring freeze. They'd been hiring. They were planning on more hiring. Can't do it now. So there's a hiring freeze there. Cook Medical in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They manufacture pacemakers. They shell. They had plans to build five new plants over time in the United States. Those plants are all on hold. Everything's been put on the shelf. No new plants as long as they have to contend with this. Bowringer Laboratories in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. They make surgical equipment. No new hires. Hiring freeze at a time when our unemployment rate is so unacceptably high. So many people looking for work. B. Braun. They make a wide, a wide range of medical equipment located in the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania. Hiring freeze and immediate and drastic cuts in research spending. What else can they do? Such a huge new chunk of their revenue is being taken. This is an ill-conceived tax. It is costing us jobs. It is costing us innovation. It is costing us in the quality of health care. And finally, everybody gets that, as evidenced by 79 members of this body voting to repeal it. And we're denied the opportunity to just have a binding vote? It's, it's shocking to me. Well, I think that the senator from uh, Pennsylvania, listing these companies, many of those same companies have facilities in, in Indiana. In fact, Cook International was founded by Bill Cook in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, working out of his uh, study in his home um, initially, and now in an international company for providing thousands of jobs uh, across the country in Pennsylvania, in Indiana, and other places. And, and uh, unfortunately, Bill passed away this year. That company is going forward, but there were five new facilities hiring numerous people, advancing their products that are saving lives and making lives better, that are now put on hold as a result of this tax being imposed on their gross sales, not on their profits, but on their gross sales. So you can take in a million dollars, but it costs you two million because you're developing a new product, and you lose a million, and the government says, we're going to tax in every penny that you took in, regardless of whether you made a profit or not. It's just unthinkable. And to think that a majority of Democrats, thankfully, have joined us in this effort, uh, and we got 79 votes out of 100 to repeal this, and yet we're not able to vote on it? Why are we not able to vote on it? Because the White House doesn't want to lose that money coming in that is so egregiously taxed to pay for, to try to pay for, some of the Unaffordable Care Act. Obviously, it's unaffordable, or they wouldn't have had, had to add this. And so that's just one of many things that we would like to debate, we would like to vote on, that we think can, can go at some of the egregious stuff that's in this Obamacare. Now look. The reality, the hard truth is this. Despite all of our best efforts, and I want to make this point clear, every one of 46 Republicans, our total here in the United States Senate, is fully 100 percent committed to the repeal, the defunding of Obamacare. Unfortunately, it takes 51 in order to achieve our goal unless we get some help from the other side. There's no indication of that now. We've gone through several machinations this week. There will be some votes coming up. I want the vote to be clearly a yay and an A. You know, I, people go home and they say, you know, don't hide behind this procedural process of cloture. We don't even know what that means, and this is a procedural move. And over time, politicians have figured out ways to go back and say, well, no, 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 that's, I'm really not for that, or I'm not really against that. We had a procedural move, and yeah, I was for this, or I was against that procedural move because it, it denied us amendments, or did this, or did that. The real vote is when it comes down, as, it's as old as the Bible. Let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay. Are you for Obamacare or against Obamacare? That's the vote we will have when the majority leader comes down here and offers a motion 
to strip the defunding of Obamacare out of this bill. I don't support a shutdown. I might support a shutdown if it would achieve the goal. But the truth that has not been told to a lot of the American people by some outside groups promoting this is the fact that defunding Obamacare doesn't begin to achieve a majority of the funding because a majority of the funding is mandatory, not discretionary, and our vote on this matter will not affect that mandatory. So all the taxes will go forward, and much of the implementation of Obamacare will go forward if no matter how we vote on this. And so that fact has to be recognized, and it also has to be recognized that it does not appear that we have the votes, and certainly we don't have the votes to override a veto by the president who is not going to um, say, hand me a pen. I, yeah, sorry, this is a terrible idea. Um, I see what's happening here. Yeah, we should just cancel this program. I haven't heard the White House give any indications that that's what's going to happen. So those who say the vote is on a procedural motion, um, essentially want to shut down the government, number one, maybe that would be worth it if it accomplished the goal, but to do it by not accomplishing the goal takes us nowhere. So what we're trying to do is basically say, yep, let's vote to, def vote to defund it. Let's vote to repeal it. But if that doesn't work, if that doesn't pass, then let's see if we can at least do something I'm not ready to give up. I'm not ready to say that this vote, if we don't pass this vote on a cloture motion, that that's it. We'll never have a chance at this again. Are you kidding me? I mean, people are just learning about uh, this Obamacare. The public is building. I, I commend Senator Cruz for standing up and, and highlighting this issue. I couldn't have stood here for 21 hours. I wouldn't have made it. But uh, more power to him. I mean, he has brought this issue to us, and, and he is focus the, the Americans' attention on this particular issue. But given that attention, that certainly doesn't mean we're going to give up. Uh, Senator Toomey and I are going to go forward. We have some um, uh, provisions here that we think will make a difference. I have offered, and Senator Toomey also offered, also offered to uh, uh, delay the implementation of this. We delayed it for the employers, the big business, but what about the individuals? What about the people in North Dakota, Louisiana, Alaska, just to name a few, what about, I know for sure, Indiana and Pennsylvania. Um, why should we impose on individuals a mandate when we don't impose it on the businesses? The president has said, and hey, we can't get this act, our act together here with the businesses, so we'll give you a one-year waiver. Well, let's give that, in fairness, let's give that to the individuals. And that is exactly what we're about here. And I, at this point, uh, Madam Chairman, would like to ask unanimous consent that the pending amendments be set aside and it be in order to call up my amendment, numbered 1979. I further ask consent that the debate on the amendment be limited up to up to one hour, equally divided, in the usual form, and I further ask consent that following use or yielding back of time, the Senate proceed to a vote on that amendment with no intervening action or debate. Is there objection? Madam President. Senator from Montana. I object. Objections heard. Well, Madam Chairman, I want to yield back uh, to, my, to my colleague here. I, I regret that we're not able to take this up. I regret that we're not able to have a debate or a vote on this matter. Um, we're going to do all we can to continue to address and to work for and to fight for the repeal and the defunding, however we accomplish it, of a piece of legislation that was jammed through the process without any bipartisan support that is now unfolding before our very eyes, and we see what a colossal mess that it's making. We are not giving up on this process. In fact, we're going forward. This is not this first vote on cloture. That's not the beginning and the end of this. That's the beginning. And as this unfolds for the American people, I think we're going to gain the support on a bipartisan basis to uh, uh, get rid of uh, this, start over with more responsible, cost-effective, meaningful, worthwhile provisions that address our health care needs and not take this one piece fits all and jam it down the throats of the American people. I'd like to yield back to my colleague. Uh, thank you. Madam President. Senator from Pennsylvania. Um, I want to commend the Senator from Indiana. I agree entirely. I think this is really an outrageous process. Let's, let's consider where we are and why we're here. 
we've got this another man, um, um, manufactured fiscal crisis, manufactured because the majority party that controls this body refuses to bring out appropriation bills. We had one appropriation reach the floor this entire year. If you don't do appropriation bills, you run into this cliff at the end of the process. And so now where are we? We've got this giant CR, this huge uh, omnibus, whatever you want to call it. It's going to be here on the, on the floor for a vote. Senator Reid has decided he's used his power to make sure that he gets to have an amendment, actually gets to have a couple of amendments, gets to gut it of the language that would defund Obamacare, uh, which will be on a party line vote. And when I ask for unanimous consent to bring up amendments that have broad bipartisan support, including one which has been supported by two-thirds of all the Democrats and every Republican, I'm not allowed to offer that amendment. So we have a completely dysfunctional Senate. It is manifesting itself very clearly today. And uh, frankly, given where this is leading and given the fact that one party here is not given an opportunity to weigh in and engage in this debate and offer amendments, I can't support cloture on the underlying bill. I yield the floor. Senator's time has expired. Uh, Madam President. Senator from Montana. Madam President, um, this hour majority time, I ask consent that the following senators have 20 minutes each, Senator Baucus, Senator Franken, and Senator Leahy. Without objection. Madam President, on September 26, 1987, 26 years ago this very day, President Reagan faced a Congress playing politics with the nation's debt ceiling. Knowing the catastrophic consequences the fault would have on America's economy, President Reagan addressed the nation. Speaking from the Oval Office, he said, and I quote, Congress consistently brings the government to the edge of default before facing its responsibilities. He continued, and I'm quoting him, this brinksmanship threatens the holders of government bonds and those who rely on Social Security and veterans benefits. Interest rates would skyrocket. Instability would occur in financial markets. The federal deficit would soar. The United States has a special responsibility to itself and to the world to meet its obligations." End quote. That was a pretty stern warning. While spoken more than a quarter century ago, President Reagan's words, sadly, still ring true today. I hope my colleagues listen to those words of reason. I hope my colleagues in the House of Representatives heed the warning from President Reagan about using the debt ceiling for brinksmanship. As we know, the federal government hits its debt limit on May 19th. For the past 130 days, the Treasury Secretary has been using what are known as extraordinary measures to continue funding the government. We are running, therefore, on borrowed time. But those extraordinary measures will be used up by October 17. And at that point, we will have exhausted every measure. Default, that is, U.S. not paying its debts, will occur unless Congress acts to raise the debt limit. Now, there will be much debate in the coming days on how to deal with the debt limit. The House CR, the continuing resolution, which we have before us today, contains a proposal that some claim would avoid default. What is it? What do they claim? What's the provision? Well, it's a dangerous plan that gives the Treasury Secretary the unprecedented power to prioritize payments. That is, the Treasury Secretary himself decides what obligations should be paid and not paid. That is, once the debt limit is surpassed. In short, the power to pick and choose which bills to pay. The House CR does, however, identify two specific payments as priorities. That is, they have to be paid first. What are they? That's Social Security and interest to holders of U.S. bonds. They're all first in line. Everybody else has to fight among themselves. We're all familiar with Social Security and its importance. That's a given. But the American people may not be as familiar with the principal and interest on U.S. bonds. This is the payment that Uncle Sam makes to various persons and countries that hold our debt. They can be U.S. citizens, 
who hold our debt, or they could be countries like China, Japan, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. And I might add that the foreign countries that hold most of U.S. debt, um, among those countries I listed, are China and Japan. They hold most foreign debt. The United States Katrina uh, Resolution categorizes the interest to these foreign bondholders as a must-pay bill. You must pay those first. That is, Social Security and interest. They leave all other obligations of the federal budget to be paid only by the revenue treasury, by only by the revenue that the treasury has on hand on any given day. Some days as revenue comes in, some days more revenue comes in more than other days. Critical programs will be left fighting the remaining scraps of funding. In effect, the House proposal to prioritize payments would result in the interests of Americans veterans the unemployed and students, among others, being placed behind the interests of countries such as China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. So it's pay China first, it's pay U.S. veterans second, if there's money left over to pay U.S. veterans. This proposal makes no sense. Here are just a few of the programs that would compete for funding under the House plan. Veterans benefits, child nutrition, military salaries, military operations and maintenance, Medicare payments to doctors and hospitals, student loans, highway funding, dollars for air traffic controllers, unemployment insurance, and tax refunds, just to name a few. They're all going to have to compete with each other for what's left after interest on the debt and Social Security payments are made under the House measure. So can you imagine the result? Medicare beneficiaries will be pitted against disabled vets, each fighting each other. Students receiving Pell Grants will be up against patients receiving medical care. Doctors conducting cancer research pitted against agents patrolling our borders. The chaos that would ensue would be unimaginable. We can't even begin to fathom the chaos, Madam President. When the scheme was first proposed during the debt limit debate in January, it became to me pretty obvious what this is really like, what it compared to. It compared to the movie Hunger Games. Hunger Games, where individuals were out scrapping, trying to save their own lives, and killing other people to save their own lives. The sequel to Hunger Games is not out until the November, Madam President, but we can now see the coming attractions in the House CR with the prioritization, prioritization provisions. Their plan for debt prioritization would pit one program against another in a fight for survival. Under this ill-conceived plan, the, Treasury of the Secretary of Treasury will be given unprecedented power to decide which programs are funded and which are eliminated. It's in the Treasury Secretary's hands. He decides. The President decides. Do veterans get paid? Do Medicare beneficiaries get paid? Military get paid? Military get paid? That's up to the Treasury Secretary and the, and the President. No such power should ever be placed in the hands of any Treasury Secretary, regardless of party affiliation. And no member of Congress who believes in our system of checks and balances can honestly advocate for this idea to stand. And after all, under our Constitution, Article I is Congress decides what payments to make, what appropriations we made, not the executive branch. Finally, this House proposal is wrong for the country. Why? because it ignores the progress we've made over the past two years to actually reduce America's deficits and debt. With the adoption of the Budget Control Act in 2011 and the fiscal cliff agreement earlier this year, deficits are falling. Debt has been stabilized. Together with interest savings, these actions will cut the deficit by about $2.8 trillion over the next 10 years. Add in the savings from winding down operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the total deficit reduction reaches almost $3.7 trillion over 10 years. These are real savings. All this progress must not be ignored. I agree with my colleagues that even more can be done to reduce the deficit and promote economic growth. But those actions should be separate from the debt limit debate. It's a different subject. We are in no position to play games with the economy. It is completely irresponsible to threaten default on the debt. Since 1789, this country has always honored its obligations. We've paid our bills. We're known for that. 
Americans know, people around the world know, America, up to this date, anyway, has paid its bills. Even when the White House and the Capitol were burned to the ground in 1814, guess what? America still honored its debts. And yet I heard a senator say just a week ago that failing to raise a debt limit is, I quote him, no big deal. No big deal. I couldn't imagine it when I heard those words. It's, it's more than a big deal. It's more than a huge deal. It's a catastrophic deal. It's something that's just so bad it's unimaginable. Have people forgotten the summer of 2011? Remember August 2011? Have people forgotten what happened when Congress failed to address the debt limit decisively? I remember the dysfunctional debt ceiling debate led to the first ever downgrade of America's credit rating. First ever downgrade of America's credit rating. I remember the stock market plunged 635 points in the day after the S&P downgrade. I remember that 14-day period, that trading period in the summer of 2011 when the Dow plummeted more than 2,000 points, about 20 percent. Consumer confidence back then dropped even lower than it did in the heat of the 2008 financial crisis, and it took nearly a year to recover. Worst of all was the impact on jobs. During the months that Congress was fighting over the debt limit, job creation fell by nearly 50 percent. And remember, Congress did still raise the debt ceiling without defaulting, but the political brinksmanship did all that damage to our economy. We did raise the debt, but look at the damage the brinksmanship caused, uh, damage that caused to our economy. We cannot let that happen again. We cannot let that happen again. Time is running short. We need to stop playing games. This will of fight is getting us nowhere. Enough with the threat of default. Enough with the schemes to prioritize payments. And as President Reagan said, and I quote him, the United States has a special responsibility to itself and to the world to meet its obligations. It's time we accept our responsibility. It's time for us to work together. It's time for us to get the job done. Madam President, thank you. I yield the floor. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Federal government funding debate continues at this hour as we uh, get closer to a possible government shutdown on September 30th. The latest Senate proposal, which was offered yesterday, includes a shorter term funding the government through November 15th instead of December 15th in the House bill, along with taking out House language that would defund the Affordable Care Act. A vote on the amended version is expected to take place an hour after the Senate gavels in tomorrow, although it is possible that Senate leaders could agree to vote on that bill today. but. As, uh, as things stand right now, it's set for some time tomorrow. The House is in session today. Members taking up just a few bills today as they await action in the Senate on the continuing resolution. You can see the House live on our companion network, C-SPAN. While we uh, wait more action on the floor, here's what some of you are saying about the budget debate. You can use the hashtag C-SPAN chat to offer your thoughts. Okay. 
President. Senator from Minnesota. Madam President, I would ask that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Thank you. Madam President, I'd like to talk a little bit about health care reform. Soon over a million Minnesotans will have the opportunity to buy their insurance on Minsure, Minnesota's health insurance marketplace. Minnesotans who buy their own insurance on the health insurance marketplace, including Franny and, and me, will have the opportunity to compare plans and choose the coverage that works best for their families. Not only will Minsure make the options clearer and more accessible, but the health reform law is also making sure that Minnesotans feel secure in their health coverage. That's because insurers can no longer cap the amount of benefits that you can get over the course of your lifetime. They can't drop you if you get sick. And they cannot discriminate, uh, discriminate against you based on a pre-existing condition. And there's a lot in the health care reform law that a lot of Americans don't even know about yet. For example, I championed a couple of key provisions that are improving the quality and the value of health care coverage that we all rely on. I authored a provision requiring health insurers to provide a good value for your premium dollars, and I helped to establish a national fund for health care prevention. Now, why is this especially important right now? Well, because the House of Representatives passed a continuing resolution to fund the budget that also defunds the health reform law. So before we decide on that measure, I want to make sure that we remember what is in this important law. First, we are requiring insurance companies to give their customers good value for their premium dollars. One thing that many Americans don't know is that millions of Americans are getting rebates from their health insurance companies when those companies don't provide that value. I wrote the provision that does this. It has the catchy name medical loss ratio, which is sometimes called the slightly more catchy 80-20 rule. Because of my medical loss ratio provision, which is based on a Minnesota state law, health insurance companies must spend at least 80 percent of their premiums on actual health care. Not on administrative costs, not on marketing, not on profits, not on CEO salaries. And if insurance companies don't meet the 80 percent for individual and small group markets or the 85 percent for large group policies, well then the insurance company has to rebate the difference. And the fact is, my provision is working. Last year, nearly 13 million Americans benefited from checks from their insurers. And this year, about 8.5 million Americans benefited from rebates that were sent out in July of this year. And that's a good thing, fewer people getting rebates. This year is a good thing, because that means that insurers were saving you money on the front end instead of rebating you the money on the back end. And that is part of why health care costs have risen in the last three years at a slower rate than in any time in the last 50 years. Now, is that entirely due to the Affordable Care Act? No. But in contrast with what's being put out being put out here and being put out there, we are not seeing the cost of health care sp spike. In fact, just the opposite is true. 
I'll say it again. Health care costs have gone up less, have risen at a slower rate in the last three years than at any other time in the last 50 years. The bottom line is that my provision is making insurance companies more efficient and helping keep health care costs in check for people, and I'm very proud of that. People also don't know how much we did to improve access to preventive health care in health reform. Anyone who's ever gotten a flu shot knows that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Along with former Republican Senator Dick Luger of Indiana, I fought to get the National Diabetes Prevention Program included in the health care law, the health reform law. And it exemplifies the benefit of this kind of reform to our health system. This program, which was piloted in St. Paul, Minnesota, by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, involves structured nutrition classes and exercise at community-based organizations like the YMCA. It has been shown to reduce the likelihood that someone with pre-diabetes will be diagnosed with full-blown type 2 diabetes by nearly 60 percent. That's pretty good. And the program doesn't just make people healthier. It also saves everyone money. The Diabetes Prevention Program costs about $400 per participant as compared to treating type 2 diabetes which cause, costs more than $7,000 every single year. That's why United Health, the largest private insurer in the country that also happens to be headquartered in Minnesota is already providing the program to its beneficiaries. In fact, the CEO of United Health told me that for every dollar they invest in the diabetes prevention program, they save four dollars on health care costs later on. This homegrown program is funded out of the Prevention and Public Health Fund, which is another program in the health reform law that is designed to invest in evidence-based health care prevention in communities across the country. In Minnesota, the Prevention and Public Health Fund has supported tobacco cessation programs. It has helped to prevent infectious diseases, and it has expanded our desperately needed primary care workforce. Preventing disease while saving money, preventing disease while saving money, that's smart reform. We did a lot of other things in the health care law too. I worked with several of my colleagues to develop a value index which will change the way Medicare pays physicians to take account of the quality of the care that the doctor provides, reward quality instead of quantity. My home state of Minnesota is the leader, the leader in developing, in delivering high value health care at a relatively low cost. And traditionally, we have been woefully under reimbursed for it. For example, Texas gets reimbursed almost 50 percent more on average per Medicare patient than Minnesota. Now this isn't about pitting Minnesota against Texas or Florida. It's about rewarding these states, those states, to become more like Minnesota. Imagine if we brought Medicare expenditures down by 30% around the country. 
It would bring enormous benefits, not just to Minnesota, but across the country, because it will bring down the costs of health care delivery nationwide. I'm working very hard to make sure that health reform works for Minnesota. The implementation of any major reform is going to be a challenge. But I don't think that Minnesotans or Americans want us to keep looking backwards. They want us to move forward and to implement the law as best we can. They don't want the House of Representatives to waste precious time and vote to repeal the law for the 42nd time. The fact is, if the law is repealed, a lot of things Americans like will be taken away from them. Americans don't want seniors' prescription drugs to go back up. They don't want children with pre-existing conditions to be kicked off their health plans, which are just a couple of things that would happen if the law were repealed. Last year, more than 54,000 seniors in Minnesota got a 50% discount on their covered brand name prescription drugs when they hit the donut hole, Medicare Part D. This discount resulted in an average savings of $644 per person and a total savings of more than $34 million in Minnesota alone. And, and we're not done. By 2020, the donut hole will be closed completely. But that, the closing of the donut hole, would go away if we repealed the health reform law. And thanks to a provision that allows young adults up to the age of 26 to stay on their parents' health insurance, 35,000 young people in Minnesota and more than 3 million young people nationally were able to keep their health coverage. Those young people would be kicked off of their coverage if we repealed the health care law. Health reform also ended insurance companies setting lifetime limits on the amount of care that you can receive. So if you or a loved one gets sick, you can never be told by your health insurer that's it. No more coverage for you. You, you know, go ahead, file for bankruptcy. And guess what? If Congress repealed the health reform law, that would go away too. I'm not saying the law is perfect, but the, if there are problems, the American people want us to work together to fix them, not refight old fights. And that's what I hope to do, move forward by implementing the law and making any changes that we need to make along the way. Millions of Americans across the country are already experiencing the benefits of this law. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting the implementation of the important provisions that I have outlined here today. Thank you, Madam President, and I yield the floor. The floor. Okay. Madam President. Senator from Vermont. Madam President, what is the uh, parliamentary situation? The Senate is currently considering H.J. Res 59, the continuing budget resolution. Thank you. Madam President, um, I listened this week to the distinguished chairwoman of the Appropriations Committee. Senator Mikulski made a compelling case for passing a clean, short-term, continuing resolution through November 15th of this year so we can actually get on the business of debating and passing appropriations bills. We have a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing to uh, to quote uh, Shakespeare here, uh, but we actually ought to 
vote up or down on something. We ought to actually, it, it's easier to give speeches or phony filibusters or whatever and say, look what we're accomplishing. Well, it's not accomplishing anything. It's allowing you to go home and saying, I, I never voted on this, but here's what I would do if I could vote. Well, here's a way to vote. I agree with everything the chairwoman said, and particularly about the bipartisan way the committee has written and reported bills this year. Any one of those bills could be debated and voted on today. Vote yes, vote no, but vote. Not maybe, but yes or no. Conference them with the House if they pass, send them to the President. Actually, there's some precedent for doing that, precedent of over 200 years of precedent doing it that way. And so we repeat this all too familiar drama, where, again, the high stakes stalemate over simply keeping the federal government functioning. What has once been the regular business of Congress has again been replaced by political theater and another artificial made in Congress crisis that threatens the economy and in ways large and small threatens every single family in America. Don't come on this floor and say you stand for family values when you're willing to destroy the plans for retirement of families, the savings for their children to go to college, their own economy, and possibly their job. Because once again, grandstanding prevails over common sense, comedy, cooperation, three values that are vital to the effective functioning of representative government. And those who travel around our states, and I do all the time, and we listen to our constituents, we know the cost of a government shutdown, the devastating effects of sequestration. Vermont is not unique in having fewer children in Head Start program, or medical researchers at our fine institutions who can't obtain research grants, or seniors who are cut off from Meals on Wheels, or young veterans back from Iraq or Afghanistan who can't find jobs, or families sleeping in shelters or on the streets because there's no safety net housing assistance. But some members of the House and Senate whose pay will continue will say how we've got to cut off all, the, all this help. What are we as a country? You know, the decisions we make have real and serious consequences for our economy, for our children and our community, ranging from St. Johnsbury, Vermont, to Houston, Texas. And as chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee that funds the Department of State and Foreign Operations, let me speak briefly about the consequences of shutting down the government and have a full year continuing resolution. Let me talk about what that does for U.S. national security. Because it should make every single senator of either party think long and hard about the role they want the United States to play in an increasingly competitive and dangerous world. We hear over and over again on this floor the saying, freedom isn't free. Well, it's not. And the corollary of that is neither are U.S. security and U.S. influence. And by doing this continuing resolution, not having regular order, here's what's at stake. U.S. leadership in the Middle East, at the United Nations, in Africa, in South and Central Asia, and in fact here in our own hemisphere. If the government shuts down, the impact's going to be felt here at home. It's going to be felt by our allies, but more importantly, it's going to be exploited by our adversaries. And just watch, look at what's happened the last few weeks in Kenya the last few days in Kenya. Do we have adversaries? Madam President, we have very serious ones. So it's the worst hypocrisy because those same senators who are toying with shutting down the government want the United States to respond when war breaks out in Syria or famine in Ethiopia or an outbreak of the Ebola virus 
or a devastating earthquake in Haiti, or a terrorist attack in Kenya, or the false imprisonment of a constituent in Nicaragua, or the kidnapping of an American missionary in the Philippines. They will come to the floor and give great speeches, one in the United States to solve the problem, or to rally the others to help solve it. But they're willing to do away with paying the salaries of our diplomats, or our aid workers, or our due to the United Nations, or emergency food aid, or support for NATO, or the World Health Organization, or the myriad of other programs and organizations depend upon us and serve our interests around the world. They think that somehow this is going to be paid for with pixie dust. Well, you watch that movie as a child. We're grown-ups now. We're dealing with the real world. Because when we pull back, when we don't lead, others are only too happy to fill the vacuum. Talk about this shutdown. It would mean the Export-Import Bank, which provides financing to United States companies, would immediately stop processing new applications. It would lose two to four billion in monthly income for U.S. exporters. It would jeopardize approximately 30,000 American jobs. And it would reduce deposits to the U.S. Treasury by 15 to 20 million per month as a result of fees that go uncollected by the bank. The Overseas Private Investment Corporation. It's a corporation that provides financing and insurance to American companies that invest overseas, it loses its authority to function. It couldn't make disbursements, it brings to a screeching halt the activities of hundreds of U.S. businesses that rely on OPEC financing. The state foreign operations bill, the Senator Lindsey Graham and I wrote, that was reported by the Appropriations Committee on July 25th by a lopsided bipartisan vote of 23 to 7 protects U.S. national security interests, but also responds to compelling humanitarian needs because we Americans do feel we have a moral responsibility as the wealthiest, most powerful nation on earth. And this speaks to the moral core of what we are as Americans. Senator Graham's and my bill includes eight $0.5 billion for global health programs. A full year continuing resolution would mean $389 million less to combat HIV, AIDS, and other preventable diseases like malaria, tuberculosis, pneumonia, malnutrition. None of us have children or grandchildren have to worry about malaria, tuberculosis, pneumonia, and malnutrition but with the relatively small amounts that we spend, we can help people and children in other countries. And doesn't that speak to our moral center as a nation? Because if we have this continuing resolution, it's going to mean tens of thousands of additional deaths from these diseases. Tens of thousands. Look at the visit some of these areas as I have and other senators have and see these children and look at them and say, I've just condemned you to death. I've condemned you to death because you were born in the wrong place and you're poor. It means tens of thousands of additional children orphaned by AIDS. It means millions fewer life-saving immunization for children. So tens of thousands of preventable deaths. The immunization that my grandchildren get is a routine thing. For pennies, we can provide to thousands of children around the world. And we're saying, no, we're not going to do that because we have a political point to make. Madam President, we're grown-ups. We're not soundbite aficionados. We should be legislators. The Senate bill includes $2.5 billion, which is 115 men above a full year continuing resolution for programs in the poorest countries. 
And these are bi have bipartisan support, Republicans and Democrats supporting for basic and higher education, food security, energy, and water and sanitation programs. And Madam President, if we're not interested from a moral point of view, if we're not interested because it hits our conscience, then let's just be pragmatic of our security. Because if we don't do this, the alternative to development and opportunity is poverty and religious extremism, transnational crime, violent insurgencies. It is a growing reality across the globe, from Somalia to Mexico, and it threatens our economy, our security, and the security of our allies. We think it's a dollar and cents, but if one of our constituents is trapped in one of these areas where there are terrorist groups, terrorist groups that we could have undermined if we'd been in there working with the governments of those countries, we say move heaven and earth to get them out. Well, we don't have to move heaven and earth. We can just start doing basic work today. But unfortunately, those who favor a continuing resolution will slash the funds that count of these threats that I talk about from Somalia to Mexico. And the list goes on and on. A government shutdown is a complete failure of our responsibility as legislators. We're sent here to make decisions, not slogans, to make government work for the American people, for the good of the nation, including our national security and our interests around the globe. Madam President, over and over again, there are those who want to give speeches, but they don't want to vote on anything real. It allows them to go home to their supporters and take any position they want because they never voted. Well, I would tell you right now, funding the government by continuing resolution, we have to continue to do that. That's irresponsible and it's dangerous. It diminishes our staying in the world. It erodes our leadership. It's unworthy of the Congress. It's a betrayal of the people who sent us here. Let's have, if not the courage, at least the honesty, at least the honesty to bring up these appropriations bills and vote on them, one by one. Vote yes, vote no, but vote them. And stand up and be counted. Don't hide behind the baloney we've heard. Madam President, I ask consent my whole statement be made part of the record. Without objection. Pre Madam President. Mr. Leader. I'm reminded when I hear the distinguished President Pro Tem of the Senate talk why the people of Vermont so love him. Here's a man who has uh, set all kinds of records in Vermont first Democrat elected and on and on with all the many accolades that he has. And so I have always admired and appreciated him. And each day that goes by, I understand better than I did the last why people of Vermont revere this good man. Madam President, I ask the chair to lay before the Senate a message from the House with respect to H.R. 527. Clerk will report. Resolved that the House agree to the amendment of the Senate to the bill H.R. 527 entitled an act to amend the Helium Act and so forth and with other purposes with an amendment. I ask unanimous consent the Senate concur in the House amendment to the Senate amendment and the motion reconsider be laid on the table with no intervening action or debate. Without objection. Madam President, very important piece of legislation. It's, I wish we could do a lot more stuff like this, but this is the Helium Stewardship Act, something we've had in effect since World War II. So very, very important. Today, around America, 750,000 people will have MRAs conducted to find out how sick they are or if they are hurt or sick. Without this bill passing, the, the big magnets they have in these machines 
which are cooled only by one thing, helium. Uh, we would have to, people who um, depend on this, the high-tech industry would have to go out in the spot market and buy this stuff, which would have increased the price of healthcare delivery and making computer chips and lots of other things. So it's, um, it's a shame it was held up for such a long time for no good reason, but now we passed it and I'm very happy that everybody allowed this to happen. Does Senator from Iowa wish to be recognized? What, do we have anybody else going to use this time? Why don't we just go ahead while he's here? Yeah, yeah I might as well use the time. And, Madam President, what I'm trying to do is uh, move all this stuff along as quickly as possible. I'm going to come here a little later and, and ask consent that we move forward very quickly. Each day that we don't complete the CR, is a day closer to the government shutting down. I want no excuses from anyone about time. I don't want anyone to say that we, who majority controls the Senate, that we're doing anything to slow down this bill. I think we should move as quickly as we can. It's to everyone's advantage. If the House wants to take a look at what we've done, let them do that, get back to us as quickly as possible. We have to avoid this shutdown. The American people are afraid of what could happen. President. Senator from Iowa. Thank you, Madam President. My colleagues, I know that we've been involved in a very intense debate, long speeches, time consumed, an opportunity to uh, bring up issues that are very important particularly as we see that uh, the executive branch of government has made decisions to delay so many aspects of health care reform. It's very appropriate at this time that we delve into the shortcomings of that uh, uh, great change in health care that uh, the health care reform bill exemplifies. I was here yesterday hoping to enter into the colloquies that were going on at that time led by Senator Cruz and time ran out. So I'm here to state some points that I wanted to make at that particular time. And I will uh, start by quoting our second president, John Adams. Facts are stubborn things and whatever may be our wishes our inclinations or the dictates of our passion, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. The rhetoric surrounding this vote and the underlying issue has become all too hysterical. So I would like us all to step back just a little bit from the hysteria and focus on the facts. We have all taken to calling this legislation, Obamacare. Sometimes even the president does. For some people, attaching the president's name to this issue prevents people from paying attention to the facts. But personalizing this issue shouldn't deter us from looking at those facts. I'm not going to talk about shutting down the government. So much time and effort is being devoted to discussing a government shutdown that people are not paying attention uh, to the uh, facts that we ought to be looking at. So instead, Madam President, I'd like to set aside the hyperbolic rhetoric for a few minutes and focus on those facts. Let's talk about the real world effects of this Affordable Care Act. I'll start with a few comments directly from my constituents in Iowa. And my colleagues yesterday referred to constituents in their respective states. And I'm only going to refer to three constituent letters. The first one, quote, 
I just want to share with you another downside cause by the Affordable Care Act. Besides teaching for my school district, I also work as an adjunct instructor for various community colleges. Currently, I'm scheduled to teach four online classes at a community college in the summer. I just received notice that because of the Affordable Care Act, I'm only allowed to teach two classes because more than that would put me over the 75% load of a full-time instructor. So because of Obamacare, I will lose $4,200 of income this summer. It will also affect me at another school that I teach at during the regular school year. I know there is not much you can do until the Republicans can regain control of the Senate, but I just wanted you to be aware of another example of our current administration's lack of foresight of the impact of this law on the average hardworking American, end of quote. The second letter, quote, as superintendent of schools, I would like to express to you the impact of the Affordable Care Act on our local schools. The increase in cost due directly to the Affordable Care Act will be approximately $180,000 to offer a single health insurance to our non-certified staff. We are a combined school district of 750 students. The affected staff members are essentially part-time, hourly employees who work six and a half hours each day, 180 days per year. The only other option is to reduce hours of employees working directly with our highest need students. Additionally, we're planning on being required to pay an additional $17,500 in additional fees and taxes associated with the Affordable Care Act in the first year. Schools in Iowa can't pass that increased cost on to consumers like private industry. We are budget restricted so that an increase in employee costs means an equal dollar amount reduction in staff, classroom materials supplies, curriculum materials, field trips, all areas that strike pretty close to the child. This cost increase associated with the Affordable Care Act will, all, will most definitely result in reduced educational opportunities and increased class size, end of quote. And one final letter, Madam President, quote, I am a paraeducator. I'm writing in regard to President Obama's health care initiative. I've been told by my employer that next year my hours will be cut from full time to 29 hours a week because if I work more than 30 hours a week, they will be required by the new health care plan to provide me with insurance. This bothers me a great deal for a number of reasons. It causes stress instability, disruption of the special needs students I work with, uh, I get a smaller paycheck, and it's very unfair. In addition, I'm bothered by the lack of foresight that went into making this law. It seems grossly unfair to me. I do my job well, I'm committed and invested in it, and I want to work, but am now being told that I can't work as much because of a law I didn't ask for and that won't benefit me. I'm sure my employer is not the only one that is cutting hours because of the insurance requirement. It seems that the people that, the people that this law was intended to help are being hurt instead. That person ends by saying, please consider any actions you can to stop this law, end of quote. Madam President, my constituents are feeling the impact of this law. This is real. It is not some made-up political stunt. It is happening all over the country. Let's start with the grocery store chain Trader Joe's. After extending health care coverage to many of its part-time employees over the years, Trader's Joe, Trader Joe's has told workers who log fewer than 30 hours that they will need to find insurance on the exchanges next year. Then there's 
the business called Five Guys, a national restaurant chain that started here in Washington, D.C. The prices of burgers and hot dogs are going to rise to cover the president's mandated insurance coverage. Earlier this year, the medical device manufacturers, Smith and Nephew, announced that they were laying off 100 employees. They cited a new medical device tax, a provision of the Affordable Care Act, as a primary cause. SeaWorld is reducing hours for thousands of part-time workers, a move that would allow the theme park owner to avoid offering these employees medical insurance under the federal government's health care overhaul. The, company's, the, the company operates 11 theme parks across the United States and has about 22,000 employees. Nearly 18,000 of the 22,000 are part-time or seasonal workers. It has more than 4,000 part-time and seasonal workers in Central Florida. Under a new corporate policy, SeaWorld would schedule part-time workers for no more than 28 hours a week, down from the previous 32 hours a week. This new cap is expected to go into effect in November. With the reduced hours, those employees would not be classified as full-time employees under the Affordable Care Act. Then there's so much you've heard on the floor from different members about the recent news of the Cleveland Clinic. That clinic said it would cut jobs and slash five to six percent of its six billion dollar annual budget to prepare for health reform. The clinic is Cleveland's largest employer, second largest in Ohio after Walmart. It is the largest provider in Ohio of Medicaid health coverage for the poor. The pro 